Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Father Chris Alar here from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where today we have sunny in 86. Tomorrow it's even going to be in the 90s. And so uh, we're glad that we're inside, at least for this talk, for with you for a little bit. Today, we're going to be bringing to you another important topic, probably the most important of all, that we've done, and that is how to pray. Pray is our way to heaven, and so we are so glad you are with us. This is continuing my Explaining the Faith DVD series that you can see on your screen. Please visit, if you would like to get a copy of my talks, I have 13 talks on that DVD from Divine Mercy to Mary to the Mass to the Sacraments, um, and that suffering and suicide, and that DVD is available on our website at the, excuse me, Shop Mercy, one word, shopmercy.org slash Saturday, or you could just go to shopmercy.org directly, but the Shop Mercy gives you some other things as well. Uh, so please think about picking that DVD up. You can also get it uh, streaming live on your video, uh, streaming download at thedivinemercy.org as it's showed on the screen, slash explaining the faith. All right, so let's get into what I call the most important of topics, and that is prayer. Why is this so critically important? Well, we have to start by asking, what is prayer? Now, that might seem like an obvious question to you. And I put that up on the screen because basically, what is it? This, as I said, seems obvious, but it's really not. All right, let's look at our next slide. St. Therese defined her as, for me, prayer is a surge of the heart. It is a simple look turned toward heaven it is a cry of recognition and of love. Now here's the good part, embracing both trial and joy. All right, it's easy to embrace the joy, but to embrace the trial, that's a little bit harder. All right, now here's the key thing. Prayer, believe it or not, is not an activity. People think I gotta go pray, I gotta get my prayers in. Uh, in religious life, I hear this all the time, myself included. But it's a state of being is what it is. It's a state of self-giving, which is what is the definition of love? Self-giving. Prayer is not about what I want necessarily, and there's time for that. But it's mainly about giving, which is love, showing your love for God. And we're going to talk about all the aspects of it today. All right. It engages our whole being. That's why it's a state of being, our body, our soul, our emotions. But in essence, here's what one word prayer is. Now this, I bet you didn't know. Because it seems obvious, what is prayer? Yeah, yeah. But if I was to ask you what one word prayer is, what would you say? And you know what? I challenge some of you. Type it. Type it in the comments. What one word do you think prayer is? I want to see if anybody gets it. If anybody gets it, I'll respond back to you. But if you could think of one word that describes prayer, it's communication. Now, that's probably everybody's going to start typing communication. <laughs> it's communion with God and each other. That's where we get holy communion. Prayer is communication, and that is best found in communion. That's why the Eucharist is the ultimate form of prayer. Now, <clears throat> it's also tied to love. Yes, it is. Because love is intimacy, and intimacy is communication. So communication with God or intimacy with God is prayer. Because I just said that prayer is communication. Love is intimacy. Intimacy is communication. And communication with God is prayer. Those who are in love express themselves through communicating. Words, gestures, feelings. This is communication. You know the biggest reason 
<clears throat> that people list as failed, or excuse me, reasons for failed marriages, the number one reason, lack of communication. That's why I always counsel married people, pray together. That is the number one thing. Prayer together and engaging in the marital conjugal act. Almost every marriage couple that I have counseled that has fallen or that was falling apart was not praying together or engaging in the conjugal act. This is what we have to do. Prayer, what is it? It's standing before God. It's realizing, what should I say? If you were before God tonight, what would you do? How would you communicate? This is what I want you to think of. Well, the catechism tells us, prayer is raising one's mind and heart to God and making requests of him. Not just gimme, gimme, but make me a better person. Help me grow in virtue and holiness. Basically, it's a covenant relationship with God and you. Do you know you read in the Old Testament about all the covenants? You actually have a covenant with God, you personally, and it's prayer. That's your covenant with God. I, I read of the covenant of Abraham and the covenant of David and the covenant of Noah. You have a personal covenant with God and it is your prayer. In it, God slowly reveals himself to you. When you go to prayer, that covenant takes over and God slowly reveals himself to you and then you do the same in return. This is why prayer is so critical. You can't know each other if you don't reveal yourself to each other. A life of prayer is actually practiced in being in the presence of the Holy Trinity, holy mackerel. It's a preparation for heaven. This is why, it's like, you know what it's like? It's like dating before marriage, courtship. Now I hear this crazy stuff that young people don't date anymore and they, uh, they don't court anymore. I'm like, how do you then get to know who you're gonna marry? I don't get this. But oh, we, we, we hang out. Well, you need to get to know each other if you're gonna get married, and it's the same with our Lord. If we're gonna be in heaven, we need to go through that practice here on earth. If you could define eternal life, this one word would be prayer. That's how we know God. We know him. We know him better by prayer than reading a thousand books. We could read a thousand books and we would know him better in prayer. This is what the saints tell us. If we talk about God or read about God, we know about him, that's great. But when we talk to him, we get to know him. You cannot, now this is interesting, listen to this. If I told you what you cannot do to be a Christian, or let me reflip that, in order to be a Christian, you must be what? And people say pro-life and believe in the Eucharist and all this is true. But do you know you cannot be a Christian without prayer? <clears throat> if you say you're a Christian, you do not pray, you cannot say you're a Christian. It's like needing faith and good works in the Bible. It also tells us in the Bible we must pray. If God is necessary and we know he is, then prayer is necessary. Why? Because prayer is our lifeline to God. So God is necessary, and therefore, if our lifeline to God is prayer, prayer is necessary. All right, let's look at the next slide. Again, obvious question. Why should I pray? Oh, well, Father, yeah, I need this, and you know, my, my mom's sick, and, and, and all those are true. We want to heal from the coronavirus, and we're going to talk about prayers for our nation. All right, at, at, as I get towards the end, please hang with me because I want to ask a special favor of you guys in prayers for our country, and we're going to talk about that coming up here towards the end of the talk. But why should I pray? You want to know the easy answer? Because God wants you to. It's not thinking about yourself, what I need, I need this, I need this, this is why I pray, Father. No, it's because God wants you to. He does because we need it for our own good. It doesn't help God. God doesn't need it. We do to remind us of God and his importance in our life. St. Gregory of Nazianzen said, we must remember God more than we breathe. <laughs> wow. 
prayer can filter out the deceptions and the delusions in life. And we're full of those. Why do you think the world's in such a mess? If the world, if each person, one of the saints said, if everybody on the earth prayed just 15 minutes a day, we would be back to paradise. We need God's spirit to prevent us from falling into sin and delusion. But then somebody once asked me, well, Father, then why did Jesus pray? He didn't fall into sin because he submitted his human will to the will of the Father, and that's what we need to do. That's why prayer is important. Notice I haven't said it's about what I want yet. That's coming up, but not yet. When Jesus prayed, he taught us to pray, to lead us to the Father. Remember my previous talks? I talked about exitus reditus. Remember, all comes from God. All will return to God. We came from the Father, and we will return to the Father. And this is what the Mass is. All of the Mass is about us coming from God, getting broken, being fixed by the Son, and then through the power of the Holy Spirit, He takes us back to God the Father. He does that through prayer. So he's living an example and showing us to do the same. St. Faustina in her diary, 14, 146, said every single grace. You want to get to heaven? I do. You need grace. You want grace? She said every single grace comes from prayer and then with trust. So we must do it. All right. So God knows what we need. So why do we pray? Why do we pray if God already knows what we need? I used to think that. I used to think there's really no reason for me to pray. God knows what he, I need and it's in his providence and nothing happens without him wanting it. So if he wants it, it's gonna happen. If he doesn't, it won't happen. What's the point in praying? Don't fall into that trap. He awaits our petitions because the dignity of us as human people and children lies in our freedom. So he wants us to use our freedom. This is a catechism, 2736. We pray to exercise our free will, which is the greatest gift God give us, gave us, and it shows our desire to be with him. He wants us to show our desire. If we never pray, we're not showing any desire to be with him. He wants, it's not about he can do it or we're going to change his mind by praying that you let me pass this test or not. It's about him wanting to see that we want to be with him. It's a loving response to God. All right, so let's go to the next slide. This is a good one. What do I need to effectively pray? All right. The catechism tells us, it says prayer does not require wisdom or saintliness because it is for fools and sinners. I love that. Prayer is not, does not require wisdom or saintliness because prayer is for fools and sinners. That is me. All right. Prayer requires three things. Love, well, actually four, love, faith, hope, and humility. Now, humility is the foundation. And remember what humility is. I did a homily on this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's false humility for Michael Jordan to say, you know, I really wasn't a good basketball player. Huh. Is that humble? No, it's a lie. He was a great basketball player. So humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less, like being a better teammate. Remember, St. Francis de Sales said, there's many souls in heaven that did many, many sins, but not one is in heaven with the vice of pride. And he said, likewise, there's many souls in hell that did many good things, but not one soul is in hell with the virtue of humility. It's our key to heaven. So we must be humble. So unless God finds our hands empty, he has nowhere to place our gifts. Humility empties ourselves so that God can fill us with his wine of the, the Holy Spirit. That's what the wedding feast of Cana was about. Remember the wedding feast of Cana, the jars ran out of, uh, of wine? Well, they were then empty. So then our Lord filled it with the best wine. 
You have to be empty, empty yourself so that God can fill you with the wine of the Holy Spirit, just like at Cana. All right, let's go to the next slide. I love this. Only when we recognize that we do not know how to pray as we ought, are we ready for the gift of prayer? That's Romans 8, 26. You gotta love that one, doesn't it? All right, so that's the importance of humility. What about love? Yes, love is important too. It's the source of prayer because it helps us to trust and be obedient. The surest test of love is sacrifice, putting someone's good above your own. So this is why to pray is a sacrifice. If I'm praying for somebody, I'm putting their good above my own time. I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing my free time to pray for them. That's love. Because I've, I've prayed and put their needs of the, the, maybe they're sick or maybe they, they're um, getting a divorce and they need prayers. My praying for them is true love because it's sacrifice because I'm putting their good ahead of mine. I'm giving up my free time. I don't have any of that anyway, so it's really, it's not a huge thing for me because I don't have a lot of free time. All right, so we could be missing other things or, or whatnot, watching, you know, TV or whatever, which again, I don't do that either, but I do watch a game, of course, occasionally or a war documentary, but all right, so the surest test of love is our time. Jesus said, come to me in the blessed sacrament. He said this in Insinu Yezu, come to me. In the blessed sacrament, because the currency of friendship is time. Jesus said the currency of friendship is time. Prayer mostly comes from the heart. And so the source of love is the heart. So it's deeper than emotions or feelings. Love is an act of the will. I choose to spend time with you. That's true love. Prayer shows that God cannot be reached just through belief alone. I mean, people say, well, I believe in God. I'm going to go to heaven. No, the devils believe in God. To believe just knows that you confirm he exists. But to love, to live and love becomes an act of the will, not just the intellect. All right, faith is also important because some things can't be proven scientifically. They are a mystery. This is what our hope is. Hope is the last one. We need hope because I have hope in heaven. I can't prove heaven exists by seeing it scientifically, but I have hope and faith that it's there for me after the death that I will incur and we all will. All right, next slide. When, this isn't a fun one, when and where to pray? Well, the true answer is whenever and wherever you can. Obviously, that's the true answer. But let's go in a little bit more. Paul said, pray always, Ephesians 6, 18, right? But this isn't always practical 24 seven. We gotta sleep, we gotta work, whatnot. But there are four, what I call the big four times you don't wanna forget to pray. Now pray throughout the day, pray unceasingly. The, the big four, what I call big four times to pray are these. Look at your screen. When you wake up, even if it's just good morning, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, uh, I say every morning, um, you know, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of this day. Help keep me free from all sin and, and, and you know, safe from all distress, like we say in the Mass. Give praise to the Holy Trinity. Next is at meals. Please, we forget this one all the time. We just grab our sandwiches, we run. Do you realize how many people go without food? I know you do, but it just, it's something to not forget. And then another one we forget, after receiving the sacraments. This is a big one. This is a big one. After you receive Holy Communion, don't race out the door, beating each other to the parking lot, squealing tires, getting out of the lot. When did you stop to say thank you? If somebody saved your life, if somebody saved your life from drowning, wouldn't you say stop to thank them? Or would you just race home to watch the ball game? Heck no, <clears throat> you would be all over them thanking them. All right, so don't forget after receiving the sacraments. Next, at bedtime, say, Lord, thank you for getting me through another day for the sins I've committed, I'm sorry. Maybe do a little examination of conscience. 
but also pray before major decisions. This is what Jesus did. Do you know he prayed before picking the disciples? Well, gee, he's God. He would have known who he wanted. He still prayed before he picked the disciples. All right, we also need to pray before big decisions. Now, when else do we pray? We need to pray. We have to make special times in our day to pray. Uh, we'll talk about a holy hour coming up in a minute. That's a great example, making other times during the day to pray. Do you know that those in Islam, the Muslims, you know they have five designated times to pray a day? We don't do that as Christians. Now, some religious do because we have the divine office, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But every Muslim prays five times a day. Maybe that's why they're growing faster than we are. All right, so... You'll never find time to pray. You've got to make the time. If you're going to say, I'll find the time later, you won't. I promise you. It means that you have to unmake something else. Here's what's interesting. If you're going to make time to pray, you've got to unmake something else. Because pretty much all of our days are full. Whether or not it's full with junk or good stuff, eh, that's for you to find out, right? Peter Kreeft who um, I worked with in endorsing my book. He's a great man, a philosopher at Boston College said, quote, the only way to install the tenant of prayer in the apartment building of your life is to evict some other tenant from that premises that prayer can then occupy, such as TV, sports, the internet. Few of us have any empty rooms available. So we got to evict one of those other tenants to create room for prayer in our apartment of life. When you can fit it in, will never work. I'll do my prayers, Lord, when I can fit it in. It's not going to work. Now, how long should we pray for? Now, this is touchy. As much as you can, obviously, but your fathers, your mothers, your, your, you got children, you've got spouses, you got jobs, you got careers, you've got education, whatever you're working on. But the absolute bare minimum for even the busiest people in the world, you know what it is? At least 15 minutes. Now I say strive for an hour. Strive for an hour. I work seven days a week, 16 hour days, but it's filled with stuff that if I was more efficient, I could do better. So we got to get prayer time. Try to get an absolute minimum of 15 minutes. Everybody can find 15 minutes. I could follow every one of you around and you could follow me around and I guarantee that we could find in each other's day 15 wasted minutes. <laughs> I promise. What do you want to offer God? in the apartment building of your life. Do you want to offer him the worst apartment or the best? You want to offer him the best. All right. If you wait for every other obligation, I said you're not going to pray. Uh, remember, you're going to have to make the time. Let's go to the next one. When is the best time? The saints all tell us the morning. Morning. You see the little prayer there? See that little prayer, the candle, a little prayer altar there in the house? The image of divine mercy? Prayer in the morning is really good because it gets your day started off right. Now, some people can't do that. If you can't delay these other things, maybe consider getting up a little earlier. That's what I started doing. Uh, but give God your best time. Place is also important. So where should we pray? We should consecrate a place... Holy, make it holy, place a crucifix there, a holy card, a statue, uh, an icon. In a church is best, but obviously many of you can't get regularly to the church. But you can meet God in your home, even in nature. Um, about the only little free time I said to you that I get is I like to go fishing. And I tell you, if you ever sat there and held a rainbow trout, I love to fish. We catch mostly bass. But if you ever catch a rainbow trout and you look at that thing, you will realize there has to be an intelligent designer. That thing could not come about by fluke or chance. When you look at a rainbow trout, you are going to see 
God's creative beauty beyond how beautiful. Of course, the human person is the most perfect, but I'm talking about just the beauty of nature. So you can find God. Praying while you walk is a good combination of physical and spiritual exercises. Most important thing, though, is not how you pray or how you do it, but that you do it. Just begin. Just do it. So that's our next slide. How to pray. How do we want to pray? The types of prayer. All right. I'm going to go through these. Prayer doesn't have to be done always on your knees in the church, which is beautiful if you do. Keep it up. But prayer can be private or public. Private is called personal prayer. Public prayer is called the liturgy. So prayer can be in the church by yourself or in community in the liturgy. But prayer is this. It can be private or personal. It can be public or liturgical. It can be vocal with words or silent in your heart. It can be formal, meaning I read the words of the Our Father, or I say the words of the Hail Mary. Those are formal written prayers given to us, or it can be informal. Like when we pray before a meeting, I just pray whatever God puts on my heart. You just say it as it comes to you. That's informal. It's in our own words. It can be active where we do the talking. It can be receptive where we listen to God. You talk is active, God talks is receptive. Both private or personal prayer and public or liturgical prayer are necessary. People say, well, Father, you only talk about the Mass. No, private prayer is why we're here today in addition to the Mass. The Bible tells us, go to your room, close the door and pray. But it doesn't say that's all to do. You need to worship God publicly as well. But let's start with private or personal prayer. That's what most people think of when they think of prayer. That form has three types. That's our next slide. So the three types of prayer from a personal or private prayer standpoint are vocal, meditation, and contemplative, contemplation. This comes right from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and I want to help summarize that for you. All of these forms have one common denominator, the heart, the heart. Now, let's start with vocal, all right? What is vocal prayer? Vocal prayer, you all know, you learned as a child, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be. But do you also know probably the most powerful of all vocal prayers? I bet you don't know this, and I would bet many of you don't pray it. The Psalms. Now, some of you do, God bless you. But this is an example of private prayer that's formal, meaning the words are given to us. When we say vocal prayers, when we say the ones that were given to us, like the Psalms or the Our Father, we are praying in union with the whole church. Especially if you pray the Psalms in the divine office, because then you're united with hundreds of thousands of people around the world praying those same prayers. The most powerful form of those vocal prayers is the Our Father because Jesus gave it to us in the Psalms because it's his own book in the Bible. It's the only whole book of prayer in the Bible. You know, there are Psalms for everything, for every mood, situation, or person. Um, They're prayed by the Jews and the Christians, so it unites us. They were prayed by Christ. He prayed the Psalm 22 on the cross, and he fulfilled it. You know, I mentioned the Our Father, too. Why is this important? Because Jesus gave us this. And it's important to pray because the Our Father captures our entire existence, not just the present moment, but it captures the past, the present, and the future. How's that, Father? Well, Jesus says, pray, forgive us our trespasses. That means touch the past, Lord. I've made mess-ups in the past. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread. That's the present So we have to pray in the present and ask for his blessings. But then it says, and lead us not into temptation. So even the future is brought to the throne of God. Lord, forgive our past. Help us in the present and protect our future. This is powerful stuff. But sometimes we want to pray our private prayer informally. Where we make up our own words or we just talk from the heart. 
you know, I'll, I'll say something like, uh, Heavenly Father, please send down the Holy Spirit. I say this before Mass. I, this, is, this is an informal prayer. I just make it up. It's not a written prayer of a saint. I just pray it. Heavenly Father, please send the Holy Spirit down upon us to open our minds and our hearts to receive the grace you wish to bestow. Give us this grace to lead us to eternal life. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Just whatever comes into the heart. That's informal, personal, private prayer. It's, it's sometimes good because then we don't say our prayers, but we really pray them. The problem with the formal, written ones is, Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace. You know, we, we can not pray them. We can just recite them. We want to pray them. So what makes our prayers heard is not the number of words, but the love by which we pray. All right, this is important. This is what's important. Right, let's go to the next slide. All right, the simplest form of vocal prayer is simply invoking the name of Jesus. That's the simplest form. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a poor sinner. It's called the Jesus prayer, and our youth are not being taught it anymore. And it's a shame because it is one of the most powerful prayers you can ever make. It's called the Jesus prayer, and we don't say it anymore. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a poor sinner. That prayer has everything. It invokes the name of Jesus. When you pray the name of Jesus, you have it all. You have him as God, you have him as man, and you have all creation because all creation was created through him. So some of the best form of prayers is just the name of Jesus. All right, let's continue to go on. Let's start with vocal, or excuse me, continue with vocal prayers. So I just told you some examples, the Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be, the Psalms, the name of Jesus, the Jesus prayer. Those are all vocal prayers, but let's go to another form called Acts. And this vocal prayer, as you see on your screen, is called A-C-T-S, Acts. What does that stand for? A is adoration. C is contrition meaning I'm sorry. Adoration means glory to you, praise to God. Contrition is I'm sorry, Lord, I messed up. T is thanksgiving, always thank God, especially after receiving the Eucharist. When you get up in the morning for having another day, when you go to bed for surviving the day. Supplication, what does that mean? That means intercessory prayer for others and yourself, petition prayers. All right, let's look at this. Let's start with adoration. That's basically adoring God, all right? Acknowledging that you are the creature and he is the creator. Lord, I come before you as your creature. I'm the creature. I'm the lowly creature. You are the mighty creator. I adore you. I praise you. Before you chat with God, before you just start chit-chatting, which is good, we must adore him first. He's not your lunch pail buddy, even though he wants you to take him along in your lunch to work, but he's still your God. This is why parents do not think it is the best thing in the world to be your child's best friend. You are a parent. Yes, you need to be there for them, but you have to first be a parent. God is our friend, absolutely, but he's first our God. And we must adore him. Just like you are first the parent before the, the, the child's friend. I'm not saying you can't be friends. I'm just saying you got to know the order. And in God, it comes that way too. First adore him as God. Then we do our conversations with him. But God is due our praise and worship. This is the virtue of justice. What is justice? An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? No. Justice is giving someone their due, and God is due our worship, praise, and adoration. So that's A, adoration. C, contrition. It's best to come into God's presence on our knees. Not maybe physically, if you can, that's great, but spiritually. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a poor sinner. Basically, the tax collector, publican, you know, the tax collector says, I fast and I'm this good holy man. And they, excuse me, the, um, 
the, the um, Pharisee, I fast and I'm a good man. And the tax collector put his head down. He's like, Lord, I'm not even worthy to look at you. That's contrition. To do this, examine your conscience daily. When you go to bed at night, walk through your day. Just don't hit the pillow and crash out. If you need to go to bed, then go into your room a couple minutes early and walk through your day. It's a very important part of church tradition called an examination of conscience where you walk through your day and you say, okay, I did good here, Lord. Thank you for the blessings. Oh man, I really messed up here. Lord, I yelled at my cameraman Giuseppe all over again. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I did it. I yelled it. He forgot to hit record. I yelled at him again. So, <laughs> Lord, forgive me. All right. Now, tell God that you're sorry, but don't get depressed. You know, what if I, if I mess up again? I'm a liar. No. God said, say you're sorry and try to do better. Remember, I think it was St. Therese who said, saints are simply sinners who keep on trying. She never said they don't sin. Remember, every saint, sinner has, or saint has a, uh, a past and everyone has a, a, a sinner has a future. Or saint has a future. Because we look at this as, I may not be perfect, but I can try perfectly. So saints are simply sinners who keep on trying. Confess your sins privately every day. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a poor sinner. Forgive me, I'm sorry. But then do it sacramentally at least once a month. Now, technically the church teaches you have to once a year, but I suggest trying once a month. All right, so that's contrition. Let's go on to T, A, C, T. T is thanksgiving. Count your blessings even in the poorest and most, most wretched life, there are things to be thankful for, immeasurable riches, such as life itself, salvation, eternal life, the church, God's patience with you. It doesn't matter if you're sick or poor, you still have a lot to be thankful for. I know you're saying, Father, it's easy for me to say, no, I got as many health problems as anybody between my pulmonary embolisms, blood clots, coronary artery disease, non-benign polyps in my colon, kidney stones. I've got it pretty rough health-wise, but you know what? I still got a lot to be thankful for. And so this is what Thanksgiving is. Remember, God only asks that we give him thanks. He does not demand that we feel thankful. Did you get that? That's important. Father, I feel hypocritical because, you know, I just go into prayer and I just don't have this warm and fuzzy feeling. I'm distracted. No, an act of the will is that you go and say, thank you, Lord. He only makes you say thank you, or I want you to say thank you. I'm sorry, not makes. He doesn't make us do anything. We have free will. He only wants us to say thank you. He does not demand that we feel thankful. So don't worry. It'll come. This is important. All right, and last is supplication. What does that mean? First means pray for others, intercede for others, and petition for yourself. Petition for others and ourselves. You know, the word pray means petition. That's what the word pray means. Intercessory prayers for others are great, but you know what? Don't just say, Lord, I want you to heal this person. Invoke the saints. Get the big guns. Faustina, St. Peregrine, if it's cancer. St. Faustina, if it's somebody that's struggling with trusting God. All right? It's not just interceding by ourselves, invoke the saints to intercede for our loved ones. When we pray to saints, we do not adore or worship them. God bless you non-Catholics listening in today, but we Catholics do not worship or adore the saints. We pray to them, but that's not the same thing. As friends of God, we are asking them to intercede for us and our loved ones as we would as you do with your friends on earth. How many non-Catholics go up to their friends and say, hey, would you pray for my mom? She's got to have a knee replacement tomorrow. That's intercessory prayer. We're doing the same with the saints. Oh, but they're dead, Father. Well, 
Jesus talked to Elijah and Moses on the Mount of uh, Tabor on the Transfiguration. They had long since died, but they looked pretty alive to me. And Jesus says in gospel, he's a living God. Our father is the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who they had long since died when Jesus lived. So when you pray for others, many times your problems don't seem as bad. I had one employee uh, that came to me and he said, we, we do adoration at the Marian Helper Center, my association of Marian Helpers. And one of our guys um, is managing the press department. He's been there for over 50 years. And he said, man, Father, when I go into that chapel and pray for these prayer intentions, because you know what? You, we have a prayer line. You can call our prayer line and have any prayers said. Our prayer lines are there for you. If we don't answer personally, leave a voicemail. All prayers are prayed for. Whether or not later in a transcription or live with the person, all our, your prayers are prayed for. You can call our Marian Helper Center, ask for the prayer line. You can visit micprayers.com. Again, it's M for Marian, I for Immaculate, C for Conception, one word, micprayers.com, and enroll to be a Marian Helper, and then you will receive all the graces of our prayers, rosaries, penances, everything. And I'm sorry I didn't make a slide for it, but it's M-I-C, actually I think Brother Mark may have it up there now. If not, again, micprayers.com and we pray for you. Or dot org. I'm sorry. Well, both work. Both work. Dot com or dot org. They both work. Okay? And we will pray for you. But anyway, this Charlie who runs our printing press said, not until, Father Chris, I started praying for these intentions, but our employees actually pray for your intentions. If you're a Marian helper, you can call the line and have us pray for your intentions. He said, not until I started doing that did I realize how thankful I am for the blessings I have from God and that I hope God will bless these people. That's awesome. Then prayers for ourselves are last and only for what we need. God sometimes may withhold things from us until we ask because what we need first is to pray. So if we need something, God may withhold it so that we first go and pray for it because the first thing we need is prayer. You see, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So through petition, we admit to God that we are beggars and the only thing that we are without him is miserable. That's what St. Faustina told us. She said, without God, I am miserable. And she said, you, Jesus told her, you are miserable. If you don't have me and you're left to yourself, you have nothing but misery. And so when we go to God, we acknowledge that. All right, let's keep going. Next one, meditation. This is the next, remember, the three forms of vocal prayer that I wanted to focus on. Are, I'm sorry, the three forms of prayer, personal prayer, is vocal, which we already did, like the Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be. Now we're getting into meditation. Vocal also included acts. But now we're getting into meditation. All right. What is it? This uses more internal words or themes. This is more mental prayer. It engages more of our thoughts, our imagination, our emotions, and it takes it to a higher level. Most people do their vocal prayers, but they don't get into the meditation. And this is important. You need it. You need a blend. You just can't recite prayers. You're not fulfilling the fullness of your being. It's good. But in meditation, it don't confuse it with junk like yoga and this kind of stuff. Meditation, you don't empty your mind and, and, and think you're the center of the universe. You empty your mind and fill it with Christ. That's why yoga is not what we do as Catholics. We fill our things with Christ. It's meditation. And in it, we allow the Holy Spirit to illumine our minds about the truth of God. Can you use other things? Absolutely. Books, the Bible, images, icons, even sacred music, things of creation. I like to look out at the mountains and the valley and the Brookshire Mountains and think of God. Now, another form 
of meditation. Go to the next slide, is Lexio Divina. What does Lexio Divina mean? It means divine reading of scripture. One powerful form of prayer I do every day and I invite you to join me is read the daily scripture passage for the mass and do Lexio Divina. What does that mean? Divine reading. So, okay, so what you basically do is you read it. Step one, there's four R's. I should have made a slide for this, I'm sorry. You do four R's. The first R is you read it. Then you let it sink in and you re second R is reflect. What is God's message for the world? You reflect on what Jesus is trying to tell us. The third R is to respond. What does it mean for me personally? And then the fourth R is just rest, silent, let God's word fill you. And I tell you, a half an hour, which I do every day on this, seems like three minutes. So let me just randomly pick an example. I didn't make a slide, I'm sorry. Just let me pick one off the top of my head. Um, the other day I did The Four Men and the Paralytic, one of my favorite Bible passages. All right, so I'm gonna read it. What's it about? Jesus is in the house and a bunch of people are there. The uh, visitors couldn't get to him. So four men wanted to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. They couldn't reach him. So they climbed up on the roof and they lowered him through the roof and laid him at the feet of Jesus. Jesus looked at the four men. He didn't look at the men on the mat. And he looked at the four men who brought him and he said, your faith to them, their faith has healed you. Get up and walk. So you read this. So the first R is read, you read it. And then the second R is you reflect. What's our Lord trying to tell us here? Okay, he's Jesus Christ. He has all power in the universe. He can make a crippled man walk. He just forgave sins. Not only did he hear him physically, he healed him spiritually. So in the healing of sins, he's the savior. Only God can forgive sins. He is God. He later delegated that to the priest. Well, we talked about that before. All right, so that's, that's the reflect. Now what's the respond? The respond means what's in it for me? Well, what's in it for me is that this is my personal Lord and Savior and that he can heal me physically if I trust, but if he doesn't, there must be a reason. God's will allows it, but you know what? He definitely will heal me spiritually. If I go to confession, my sins too will be forgiven, just like the man on the mat. Lord, I want to be like the man on the mat. I want my sins forgiven. He's going to say, okay, your sins are forgiven, but how does he tell us to do it? Go to the priest throughout scripture. Get, get to confession. This is the teaching of the church. So Lord, I want to be healed. This is my responding. And then finally, our fourth R, I rest. I just let it sink in. I'm telling you, a half an hour will go like that and you are meditating. Envision yourself there in the house as the, as the paralytics being lowered through the roof. Imagine yourself pushing through the crowds, not at Disneyland or Cedar Point in Ohio, but imagine pushing through the crowds to get to Jesus and then you see him heal this guy. This is powerful stuff. You can also meditate about things in your life, events. You can meditate, look at the next slide. On the rosary, what's the rosary? The rosary is not just a bunch of Hail Marys. It's, it's, the Hail Marys are background music. What are you meditating on? The scriptural passages of the mysteries of the rosary. So if our lady's talking about, or if our rosary is, is the visitation, literally envision yourself, meditate walking with Mary through the hillside of Judea, through the rocks and the thorns, trying to get to an act of charity. The scourging at the pillar. Think of your sins of the flesh and how your sins of the flesh and my sins of the flesh cause our Lord to be whipped on the back and how he must feel it. Just think, I've been whipped a couple times by mistake when we were swimming by branches and stuff like that. There is no worse feeling in the world. Envision, feel that whip on your back. Now, I'm not saying grab a whip and have somebody whip you. I'm saying you can meditate on that. That's what the rosary is. It's not a bunch of Hail Marys. It's meditation on scripture. All right, what about next slide? Stations of the cross. Brother Mark, who's running the slides today, took this actual picture. That's not Photoshopped. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That's the stations of the cross here on our grounds of the shrine of divine mercy. You can meditate on his passion. That's what Jesus said to do at the three o'clock hour. He didn't say actually pray the chaplet. 
He said, meditate on my passion. You can do this through Stations of the Cross. He said to do Stations of the Cross. The reason we do the chaplet is because it's a meditation on his passion for the sake of his sorrowful passion. So we do this at three o'clock. All right, let's go on to the next slide. After vocal prayer, we add meditation. Now let's go into the big dog, contemplation. Contemplation. This is the big dog. This is the most interior of all prayer. It's wordless. And it's also the easiest. Why is it the easiest? Because you don't say anything. You don't do anything. It's silence and surrender. Listening to God. Not doing the talking. Hearing the word of God. Again, like meditation, it's not without object. It's not necessarily objectless. Our attention is fixed on the Lord himself. Catechism tells us this, 2709. It doesn't strive to reach a mental void or place ourselves at the center of the universe, just like I said a second ago about yoga. It's about being in God's presence. You know what? Have you ever, unfortunately, had a friend in the hospital unconscious, like in a coma or an accident, and you go to visit them? They're not up. They're not conscious. And you don't say a word to them. You're just there present at their bedside. That's it. Contemplation is just simply being, finding the time to simply be with God in loving communion and silence, just being present. It's like you ever lay in the arms of your loved one? I mean, it, it, it's incredible. I remember as a little boy laying in my mom's arms, that sense of security and love. I remember with my fiance, same thing. Now God has taken me another direction to the priesthood, but it was a loving, beautiful precursor to something infinitely greater, being in the arms of God. It's funny because it's hard, this contemplative uh, prayer, because it's so simple. It's a gaze of faith just fixed on Jesus. You gaze in him and he gazes back either in the Eucharist or on the crucifix or in the image of divine mercy. Do you know that this childlike method of prayer is actually the highest form of prayer? The church teaches it is silent love with forgetting about ourselves, no self-awareness. It's a renunciation of self-will. It's all about God. You're not saying anything. I need this, I need that. You're, you're saying, Lord, fill me. Your servant is here. I am listening. And you just relax and rest in his arms. What replaces the self is not nothingness, but Jesus. Again, Catechism 2715. It's actually training for future ecstasy in heaven. How is that? Well, do you know what the word ecstasy means? It means standing outside of oneself. You always hear that. The saints were in ecstasy. That means standing outside of oneself. It is a sharing in the very life of God. Many reject this grace unknowingly. They feel, well, nothing's happening. Father, I'm just sitting here. Prayer seems to be unproductive. It's therefore useless. Well, if that's useless, then all beauty and love and joy in the universe is useless. And I don't think anybody will say that. We are simply resting lovingly in God's presence like the arms of our loved ones, but to a greater degree. And we can't force this. God gives it as a gift. It's a gift that can only be accepted in humility and in poverty. Paul, uh, John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. So prayer, it's not psychological, but it's supernatural when you get to this level. Wow. Wow. All right, what I just showed you is personal, private prayer. So again, to recap, you have vocal prayer, meditative, and contemplative. Vocal prayers like our Our Fathers, Hail Marys, our Psalms, Acts, Adoration, Contrition, Thanksgiving, Supplication. That's vocal prayer. Then we had meditation. We envision being in a scene with God, being in the scripture passage. But then contemplation is just freeing ourselves quietly and being in his presence. 
You mix these different forms of prayers and let the Holy Spirit lead. Don't go in and say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that or, or I'm going to do this at 3.30, I'm going to do this at 5.30. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. That's your private, personal prayer. But there's a greater form of prayer. Father, what could be greater than that? Public or liturgical prayer. Let's turn to the next slide. This is my famous church slide from uh, St. Albertus in Detroit, one of the most beautiful churches, St. Holy Sweetest, name of Mary, St. Jehoshaphat. Detroit has these beautiful downtown Detroit churches. But the Mass, the Mass is the perfect form of prayer. Why? Because as good as your private prayer is, we just went through it, acts and meditation and contemplation, as good as that is, we got stain blocking it. And the stain that blocks it is like if I pull the window shade down in my bedroom. God's love is like the sun. It never stops shining. Even if there's clouds and it's raining, the sun is still shining. The clouds block it. My shade blocks some of that light of God's grace coming in. So my personal prayer because of my sins and yours too, is imperfect. It's necessary. We need to do it. Why? Because it sets the stage for the perfect form of prayer. What's the perfect form of prayer? The Mass. Catechism 2643 says the Eucharist contains and expresses all forms of prayer. It's the sacrifice of praise. This is amazing. The Mass is the perfect form of prayer because it is the prayer of the Son to the Father. Remember in my old talks, you can get them on YouTube and Facebook. The Mass is God offering God to God. God the Holy Spirit offering God the Son in sacrifice to God the Father in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. So this is the perfect form of prayer. It's God offering God to God, and you can be part of it. But it, the Mass actually models what a perfect Christian life of prayer should be, both in the church and outside the church. We'll talk about that in a minute. The goal is to bring and unite your personal prayer with the public prayer of the Mass and perfect your personal prayer. Well, Father, what do I do if my personal prayer is broken and sinful? Come to confession Wipe out the mortal sins. Come to Mass. You've wiped out your venial sins in the penitential rite. Now all of a sudden, you're perfect. Your prayer is perfectly united to the perfect form of the public prayer called the Mass. God offering God to God. God the Holy Spirit offering God the Son in, union, in sacrifice to God the Father in atonement for your sins and the sins of the whole world. Catechism 1071 tells us that we are to be active participants in the prayer of the Mass. In the liturgy, all Christian prayer finds its source and goal. The structure of the Mass, as I said, reveals a pattern that we should follow in our Christian life of prayer. What, Father? I should pray outside at home like the Mass? Yes. Listen to this. The parts of the Mass taken as a whole provide us a complete model for our life of prayer. Let's look at this. When the Mass begins, we bless ourselves. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This serves as the foundation of all prayer. Why? Because we are united to the passion of Christ. We just made a cross. We share in his sacrifice with our spirit, soul, and body. We've engaged our whole spirit, soul, and body by making the sign of the cross. We call God by name as the reason we are worshiping. We are praying not on our own, but in the name of the Trinity. And the sign of the cross brands us, just like a cowboy brands cattle that it belongs to me or to him. When you make the sign of the cross, you're branding yourself that you belong to God. So on the last day, when the devil comes to claim his and God comes to claim his, you've got the brand on you saying, uh-uh, Satan, I belong to God. Then we go into the penitential rite. Here we lay before our God our sins and ask for forgiveness. This was C in Acts, contrition. Then we pray the Gloria. We praise God for his redemption. That's adoration. 
Then we do the reading of the gospel, the liturgy of the word. This is like Lexio Divina. I just said you read scripture, you meditate on it. It's reverent reading, reflecting on the sacred texts. Then we have the prayers of the faithful. That's basically intercession, supplication, A-C-T-S. Supplication is in the mass, the prayers of the faithful. We ask God to assist in the lives of all the people, ourselves included. Then we have an offertory where we prepare gifts. We offer to God our gifts. We, in prayer, offer our very selves. Then the big one, look at your next slide. What part of the mass is that? <clears throat> it's not the consecration. Consecration is already done, but this is the high point of the Mass. It goes with the consecration. It's called the concluding doxology. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. What's happening? God the Holy Spirit is offering God the Son in atonement for our sins to God the Father. God all came from God, now all is returning to God. And guess what? In that slide, the priest and the person of Christ is returning all creation back to God the Father from which it came. Incredible. Unbelievable. This doxology, we unite ourselves to Christ and we're taken back to the Father, the very place from which we came. Then we say the Lord's Prayer. We went through that. It's the perfect form of vocal prayer. We pray for the past, the forgiveness, the bread of the, of the present, and the, uh, leading us not in temptation in the future. Then, ultimately, the source and summit, we receive Holy Communion. We are fully united with God, like in contemplation, but even greater, sacramentally. Wow. So the greatest form of public prayer is the Mass. Let's go to the next slide because there's something else that we call the Liturgy of the Hours or the Divine Office. And this all consecrated religious around the world pray in unison these prayers. Every day that I pray the Divine Office, I'm united with hundreds of thousands of other uh, consecrated religious and lay people around the world who are reading the very same prayers. It's called Liturgy of the Hours of the Divine Office. It's an extension of the Mass. Now, I had a whole talk on this. I wanted to put a whole section. I'm sorry. I'm running behind. i got to wrap up my talk here. But the Liturgy of the Hours is basically the public prayer of the church to sanctify the hours of the day. So, some pray seven. We pray five. We pray uh, five offices. We pray an office of the readings, which can be done any time of the day. We pray a morning prayer. We pray a midday prayer. We pray an evening prayer. And we pray a night prayer. It is called Liturgy of the Hours because we are sanctifying the hours of the day. It's an extension of the Mass. All right. Now, as I'm running out of time here, let's finish with what's important. There's some other important things to do. Let's look at the next slide. One of the things you want to do is mix everything we just said, and that's called a holy hour. If you want to take everything we just said, mix them together, take the best of all of it, you got the holy hour. Because you got the Eucharist, God is present. You've got the time of silence and contemplation. You got time to do your vocal prayers. You got a time to come before the Lord asking for forgiveness. It's God at all. The holy hour started with Jesus in the garden when he said, could you not watch with me yet one hour? It's the story of man and his need for God. It's very, you know, there was an example I want to tell real quick. Uh, a woman told me this story and her husband was there with her. They visited us here at the shrine. And she told me the story I want to share with you real quickly. She said, you know, Father, um, I was begging my husband to go with me to Eucharistic adoration for years. And his answer always, and he's standing right next to her. And his answer always was, you know, I don't need to. God knows I love him. She's like, please come with me. He's like, no, no, no. I don't need some brick wall of a church. God knows I love him. And he'd go about his football game or go into the grocery store, whatever it might be. And she used to say, no, this is a way to show him. No, no, no. God knows I love him. So he wouldn't go to adoration. Well, then one day he had to have a hip replacement surgery. And, or no, I'm sorry, it was an outpatient orthoscopic surgery, like on a knee or something. 
And he was supposed to be in and out in just a few hours. So his daughter took him, and the wife stayed home, and he was going to be home in a few hours. But there were some complications, and he ended up getting admitted to the hospital. And he called her home that night, or that afternoon, and said, listen, they're admitting me to the hospital. And she said, okay. And he goes, what time are you going to be here to see me? Now this woman, in her wisdom, got a jolt of grace from the Holy Spirit. And she said, well, I think I'm going to run to the grocery store. I got these errands to run. I got to do this. I got to do that. He's like, what? And she's like, yeah, you know what? We got to get these bills paid. They're overdue. I got to get groceries. The kids are coming over tomorrow. He's like, did you just hear me? I'm alone here. I'm waiting for you. And he goes, don't you love me? <laughs> and all of a sudden, she paused and he goes, oh, all right, I got you. If you love me, you'll come see me. And he realized what she was teaching him. He said to her, don't you love me? If you love me, you'll come visit me. And she goes, you know I love you. I don't need to come visit you. And he went holy back. So the couple's telling me this story right here in the shrine a couple years ago, and they're laughing, changed his life. Now he goes to the holy hour every week. Isn't that beautiful? I love stories like that. All right. So loving starts with making quiet time to be with someone, and this is what you're doing with God in a holy hour. You know, there's another example. A mother, just use this, had three grown children. I read this in a book somewhere. She had three grown children. The first kept in touch with his, their mother. These were three, three girls. And the three girls, the first daughter, kept touch with her mother regularly, calling her all the time, sharing all aspects of life. The second daughter phoned, but only once a month, dutifully, regularly, but more of a just, I'm checking in. The third daughter only contacted her mother when she was in trouble or needed money. I read this somewhere, but while the mother loved all three, who do you think she felt closest to? It's hard to get to know someone that you re rarely talk to. So father, I mean, I, okay, I got you, I hear you. I want to pray, but I'm no good at it. All right? Your very willingness to pray is itself a prayer, even if we aren't doing it perfectly. If you are desiring to pray more, that shows God's grace is actively working in you. This is powerful stuff. Moments spent with God, even if they're frustrating, are moments of prayer. Even if you're in the chapel, don't say, gee, I wasted this whole hour, I got no grace. Just the fact that you're there, the fact that you made an act of the will. Love is not just an emotion. This is why divorces happen all the time. My own brother-in-law said to my sister, you know, I don't feel, see the fireworks when you walk in the room anymore. He asked for a divorce. After 24 years, if you feel fireworks every time that that spouse walks in the room, you could be a case study. Love is not just an emotion. Love is an act of the will. I choose to love you, even when you frustrate the daylights out of me. Does a mother or a father feel like getting up to change a dirty diaper at two o'clock in the morning? Do they jump up and down and go, oh, goody, I get to change a dirty diaper? Of course not. But they do it because they love the baby. That's why love is an act of the will. Even if I don't feel like it, because I love you, I'm going to change that diaper. And it's the same with the chapel. Sometimes I don't feel like going to the chapel. I've worked all day. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm exhausted. But I go in there and I say, Lord, I'm here. You know me. It's not because I want to be, but because I love you. That's what we got to do. Don't feel hypocritical and stay away. I used to do that all the time. And sometimes I still do. That's not the answer. All right. Confide all of your distractions and anxieties that you're in prayer to him. Lord, I'm being distracted right now. I give you these distractions. You need to confess that God is in charge and you are not. 
All right, the highest vocation of a human being is to become the most perfect of adorers. And you can do that in the holy hour. Wow. If someone saved your life, I said before, would you, what would you say to them? Say that to our Lord in adoration in the holy hour. Treat it like the offertory at mass. But not only bread and wine that's given in the offertory, but you're, you yourself give to him. When we offer ourselves, God can do to us what he does with the Eucharist. He accepts us. He accepts our lives, our gifts, our talents, even our weaknesses that we bring to him. Then he gives thanks to the Father because he's going to bring all of us back to the Father. So he gives thanks to the Father that we came to him because it's through him that he'll give, give us back to the Father. And he offers us, he basically breaks us. Just like the host, he basically breaks us first and then offers us his food for the world. Your food for the world of nourishment in the way you live your life like Christ. The breaking is purifying us, getting us out of our own comfort zones, snapping us out of our bad ways. All right, think of the holy hour <clears throat> as spiritual radiation therapy. <clears throat> like radiation coming out of the Eucharist. Sorry, I'm getting worked up here, but this is amazing stuff. All right, Jesus didn't just reveal the Father to us. He reveals ourselves to us. We see who we are. And many times we should see ourselves like a small child, someone who is dependent on a mother and a father. This is Mary, our mother, God, our father. So our prayers should always ask for God's will to be done. They give him permission that gives him permission. You know, they say, well, Father, God's will is going to be done anyway. In your life, God's will may not be done if you don't give him permission. God's will was for me to become a priest, but I was not going to give him permission for many, many years. I was going to get married. When you give him permission, you say, your will be done in my life, Lord. You're now giving him permission to work his will. So our prayer should ask for God's will. Let's look at the next slide. This is who you should use. Mary and the saints holding you like that little baby Jesus. Put yourself in her arms. Use Mary and the saints. The Catechism 2683 says so. Quote, Mary is the perfect prayer, meaning she's the prayer. We can pray with her and to her. The prayer of the church is sustained by the prayer of Mary and the saints as well. Mary fills in us what is lacking in our prayer. So take Mary with you into the chapel. She'll perfect in your lack of prayer what is missing. All right, close to being done here. Next slide. What about the obstacles to prayer? Oh man, there's a ton of those, isn't there? All right, so obstacles to prayer. Prayer is both a gift from God, yes, but it's also a response from us. So it requires effort. And sometimes that's met with obstacles. Prayer, the catechism actually, can you believe this? This is surprising to me. The catechism says prayer is a battle. It's a battle. It's against ourselves and the evil one who doesn't want us to have union with God. The battle of prayer is infinitely more important than any military battle in human history. Think about that. Most, as I said, most merit comes, get a load of this. If there's one thing that I think will help you get to prayer today more than anything else, it's this. There is more merit when you pray, when you don't feel like it, than when you pray full of consolation and giddiness. There's more merit because you make it an act of the will like I said a second ago. I don't want to be here, but because I love you, I'm coming here. That's an act of the will. And there's more merit when you pray when you don't feel like it. Don't hide from the chapel because you say, Lord, I'm a hypocrite. I don't feel like praying. And me being here is just hypocritical. That's the devil. All right. So what are some of these obstacles? Discouragement during periods of dryness. Father, my prayer's dry. I get discouraged. All right. God tests us. 
right? He tests us to strengthen us. These are the times that we can grow. If we offer our dryness, we can also participate in the dark night of the soul. Sometimes God does test us and he wants to know, are we going to choose Christ without comfort or are we going to choose comfort without Christ? All right, another obstacle. Sometimes I feel guilty, Lord. I have a lot of people who are wealthy tell me this. I feel guilty because I haven't given all my belongings away to Jesus. And when I go into prayer, I feel guilty. No, you shouldn't. God has given you those things to be used for his greater glory. However you do that, Tom Monahan, who I stayed at his cabin, he's a very wealthy man, but he's one of the greatest Catholics I know. He's not living on the street corner and, and gave away every dollar, but he's using what God gave him. Remember, money is not the root of all evil. The inordinate love of it is. What about the disappointment that our prayers go unanswered? Father, my prayers are never answered. Remember, we don't go to prayer to bend God's will to us. It's to bend us to God's will. And we'll talk about that here in just a second to finish. Last page. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Another obstacle. Father, I'm hypocritical because I'm a sinner. And I am going before God? Seriously? That's exactly why you do need to go before God. That's why you need prayer. But I don't feel like praying. I said, prayer like love is an act of the will. What about this one? Here's another obstacle, distraction. Father, I can't keep my mind straight. I'm thinking about making dinner. I'm thinking about shopping, getting my kids to school. And sometimes people even tell me I'm even getting pure thoughts in prayer more than any other time. Again, that's the evil one. But our Lord has an answer. Don't try to squash and hunt down and follow your distractions and beat them up. You can't. Distractions reveal what we are attached to. It's actually an enlightenment of God. If you are getting distracted in prayer, don't get frustrated and beat yourself up. Say, oh, wait a minute. God's showing me what I'm attached to. If your distraction is a particular person or, or whatnot, you, you may have an attachment or a particular thing or maybe your Facebook page or whatever it is. It might show you that you have an area to work. It's a self-awareness. This can be very helpful. Ask God to take the place of those things. And finally, a lack of faith can be an obstacle. Turn to an act of the will. Like I said, feelings are not important. Just make that decision, Lord, I'm going to come pray. Here, God wants you to rely on faith in prayer. It's really trust, like Abraham. Remember our father in faith? He was trusting. He asked him to take Isaac and to, to, to a sacrifice him. He's like, how? Well, he trusted because I don't know how you're going to do it, Lord, but you promised me that through this boy, my progeny is going to spread all over the world. My descendants will be great. How am I going to do that? How's it going to happen if you're, gonna, if you're asking me to kill him? He trusted. He had faith. So if all of this is still a problem, ask the Lord to deepen your prayer life. You must pray for the grace to deepen your prayer life. All right, two slides to go. Next to last slide, why didn't God answer my prayers? None of you have ever asked this question before, right? <laughs> all right, all prayers are answered. It's just sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> like my mom, right? I have, Mom, why can't I get this? No. Why? Because I said so. God doesn't work that way. But sometimes he does say no. Why? Because what we ask for is not best for God's plan for our life. He has something better planned for us. You know, I used to pray for a wife. I dated a, a lot. I always had a girlfriend. And, 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 and I kept thinking, Lord, how come you haven't sent the perfect person yet? And, and, and I know I've got my faults and, 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 and sometimes it's incompatible with this person. Sometimes we do very well. But Lord, how come you haven't sent me the perfect wife yet? Well, you know what? I'm super glad he didn't. Because you know what greater thing he had in store for me? The priesthood. So I thank God now he didn't answer that prayer. I was even engaged. This 
is God at work. God doesn't grant what appears to be goods, and even though they may be truly good. A wife is a beautiful thing. But he only wants us to sometimes get those things that are the best for us. And for me, it was the priesthood. All right, what about this one? Sometimes God's answer is to wait. I know we all hate that one, right? I'm very impatient. That's the one I struggle with the most. I'd rather you tell me no than tell me to wait because you're holding me on, I feel like. You're, th you're dragging me on. But God does this sometimes. He tells us to wait. Why? Because in God's timing is wiser than ours. Like I said, I waited to become a priest. And that was by God's hand only. If I would have become a priest right out of high school, I never would have made it. And the reason is because I would have wondered sometime, what's it like to have a house? What's it like to own a business? What's it like to work in corporate America? What's it like to have a girlfriend? What's it like to do these things? And, and I now experience, and I'm not looking back. I'm praising God for my past, but I only look to the future. God bless that he took me on that path. If I would have become a priest right out of high school, that's just me personally. I never would have made it. Now, other men are better than me. They can come right out of high school and be great priests. It just depends on who we are. So sometimes God tells us to wait. God knows what you need before you ask him. This is another reason that people say, why didn't he answer my prayers? Well, if God knew what I needed before he asked him, then why do I need to ask? If God knows what I need, I don't need to bother asking him. He already knows. Because he awaits our own petition, as I said before, because the dignity of his children lies in their freedom. This is Catechism 2736, as I said before. All right, a couple more. Sometimes God waits for us to pray before giving us what we pray for. Wait a minute. Why didn't the Lord answer my prayer? Because he wants you sometimes to pray more. He wants you to pray even more before giving you what you want because what you need the most is prayer. So sometimes he doesn't give you what you want, so you'll pray more because what you need most is prayer. You need prayer more than maybe that new fishing rod. Well, maybe that's not a good example. We all need a new fishing rod, but you know, maybe a new car, all right? We need prayer, <clears throat> patience, and conformity of, to God's will, and prayer provides all of that. And finally, God sometimes waits with his answer in order to make us pray without ceasing. That's kind of tied to the last one. It's to elicit our love. All right. This then is to finish kind of a summary. What all have we talked about today? Wow, we covered a lot of ground. I can't go over all of it to summarize it, but you know what? Some of the highlights. Prayer doesn't have to be, even though I gave examples of words, meditations, contemplation, it doesn't have to be just those ways. You can pray through fasting for other people or the Benedictines, aura et labora, prayer and work while you're working, in the shower or driving. Before making your prayer request though, did you ask God his will? Did you spend time in reflection and discernment? Are you asking God what is best for you rather than telling him? Prayer doesn't change God, it changes us. We need to center on the gifts, not, excuse me, we need to not center on the gifts, but we center on the giver. That's God himself. You know, here's the final word. St. Alphonsus Liguori said, those who pray are certainly saved, and those who do not pray are certainly damned. Whew. Whoa, wake up. Jesus told many who were lost that the reason was because they didn't pray. St. Faustina wrote in her diary, Jesus told her that the salvation of thousands of souls depends on your prayer. And we can help these people even years later because God is outside of time. If you listen to my suicide talk that's still online, you can see me do a whole talk about God being outside of time. And when you make your prayers, it doesn't matter if they're past, present, or future. God can apply them to your loved ones, even at the moment of their judgment. I prayed for my grandmother 10 years after she died of suicide and I believe God took those graces and gave them to her because of the catechism and the diary of St. Faustina. 
God gives the people the chance to accept his grace at the moment of their death. That's in this Faustina diary, 1486. He comes to the soul three times. And a soul, if it's not been praying, they won't recognize God. That's why your prayers are so important even years later. They can come in and be showered over the soul of that person. That even as they are being at the moment of their judgment, your prayers can help them, even if you make it years later, because God is outside of time. He's omniscient. He knows all prayers will ever make. And he's omnipotent. He has the power to apply those graces to our loved ones at any point in time. It doesn't mean you can change history. What it means is you can help your loved ones. So as Jesus said to St. Faustina, and she said in the diary 872, persevere in prayer. All right, so I want to finish with just a couple last things. The next slide is a slide of a family. Please pray. The catechism emphasizes prayers for your family, with your family, together. Remember, Father Peyton, the family that prays together stays together. The Christian family is where the child first learns education and prayer. It's the domestic church. It's where we learn from the prayers of the parents. The kids learn. God bless you. Now, I told you, and I'm sorry I went long, that I have a special favor of you. My favor is this. If you are in the United States, I beg you to pray for your country. Jesus, all over the diary of St. Faustina, I'm going to get to this in a minute. Joan and Dave Maroney talked about this in their uh, Divine Mercy for America ministry. I'll talk about that in a second, and I'm wrapping up here. If you are from the United States, please pray for your country. Wherever you are, pray for your country. Throughout the diary, Jesus tells St. Faustina to pray for her nation, to do novenas for her nation. Pray for your nation. If you're in the United States, especially pray for the end of the civil unrest and, 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 and peace and not the loss of our religious freedoms, but an opening of the churches and, and bringing back God in the sacraments. But I have a special favor for two types of people that I hold dear in my heart that I feel are the two chosen people of today, the Philippines and Poland. If you are listening from the Philippines or Poland, I beg you, if us Americans do not know how to pray for ourselves and we're not doing it, I implore you guys, would you please say a prayer, not only for your own nation, but the United States. The Filipinos are a special people. No nation suffered at the hands of Japan in World War II more than the Philippines, yet no nation remained more Catholic. I believe you are a chosen people today to fan the spark of divine mercy. You have Filipino ladies all over the world spreading divine mercy. I love the Filipinos. They're God's chosen people. And Poland, that's the spark from which divine mercy, John Paul, Faustina came. Jesus said the spark will come from Poland to prepare the world for my final coming. So you will pray, pray, I ask you for your own nation, but pray for the United States too. We are your allies and no nation suffered greater at the hands of the Nazis in World War II than Poland. No nation. Pray, pray for your country. Pray for the United States. If we can't do it ourselves, I ask your help. That's intercessory prayer. And now I want to finish. Please show the last slide. Joan and Dave Maroney have a ministry called Divine Mercy for America. You can see the slide there. You can go to their website um, that's listed on the screen. The website, divinemercyforamerica.org, is an opportunity for you to learn and grab resources for your nation. And I want to highlight something that they have on their website that you can visit. Their website has a breakdown of the novenas that Jesus said to pray for your country. The holy, the, um, uh, basically the holy hour novena the Litany of the Saints Novena, the Novena of Chaplets, and the Novena of the Holy, of Holy Communion. So Jesus said to Faustina, pray these four Novenas for your country, the Novena of Holy Hours, the Novena of the Litany of the Saints, the Novena of Chaplets, and the Novena of Holy Communion. So Joan and Dave have it on their website where you can get this, where Jesus talks about praying for your nation. It is not about the destruction of borders and the wiping out of nations. It's about praying for our country to be safe and to be protected, but most of all to be loving and willing to bring in all those who want to come, but to come 
under the auspices of helping their own lives and the lives of our fellow Americans and your nations around the world. So God bless all of you. Please visit our webpage, thedivinemercy.org or divinemercyforamerica.org. Pray that novena for your country. Pray for your own nation, but I beg your help for the United States as well. Prayer is the key. Prayer is the answer. Prayer is the only way out of this mess. Jesus told us when the demons are so great, prayer and fasting is the only way. So God bless all of you. And I apologize, I forgot to mention the beginning, it was announced that today's topic was gonna be the church scandal. And I apologize greatly because we had a shift in schedule. You can see the new schedule, it'll be on Shrine of Divine Mercy webpage. You can see the schedule, but we're gonna keep going with these talks every Saturday. And I'll post up on there the talk for next week, and we're gonna keep on going every Saturday at 11 o'clock. Sorry I went a little bit longer, but through the intercession of St. Faustina, Mary, and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and may Almighty God bless America and the whole world. Thank you, and we'll see you next Saturday at 11 a.m. Hello, everyone. If you're like us in the state of Massachusetts, where our governor has extended the non-essential business closure, you're going to be at home looking for things to do. There is probably no better time ever, before or after, than right now, than to get closer to God. You see, you cannot love what you do not know. So we want to help you to love God a little bit more by knowing Him. Instead of sitting at home on your couch, watching reruns of Miami Vice like my cameraman Giuseppe. No, I don't. I, I think that we have an opportunity now more than ever to learn our faith. That is why I have produced a new video, DVD series, that can be used as small groups and parishes or right at home on your own couch. That is called Explaining the Faith. These are my 13 favorite talks I've ever done that are regarding what we need to know about Jesus, Mary, confession, communion, why would a good and loving God allow suffering, and especially a walkthrough of the entire Mass from the start to the finish and everything that you need to know about it. Tell you what, here's a quick clip. In the church, it's just not come to stand, sit, and kneel, it's to engage in this most incredible mystery. This is what it is. The church, what makes the Catholic Church, the Church of Christ is the sacraments. The sacraments are just symbols. They do something. They're actual grace. Sacraments, if you remember your definition from catechism, are efficacious signs, meaning efficacious, they do something. They're not just symbols. They're efficacious signs of God's grace, instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is given to us. We have it so that Christ can enter into us and live in us. Now, if we don't receive him worthily, what happens? We lose that grace. So please consider, now is the time to get closer to God, and we're going to show you how. As I said, this DVD series has 13 talks that you'll be able to learn more and share your faith with everyone that you love to help get yourself and them to heaven. So please visit shopmercy.org or call 1-800-462-7426 to understand our faith better than ever before and to hear it explained in a way like never before. Thank you and God bless you.